Hey, I'm Warren Sprouse. This is the Bible Forum. We're here every Sunday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we look at life through a biblical lens. We try to solve all the world's problems in two hours or less. We're going to talk a little bit about the Trump inauguration, but we're really going to talk about the preacher, Paula White. You know Paula White. She's been around for the last 20 years, one way or another. She's a prosperity uh, kind of charismatic uh, preacherette. Well, she's been invited to deliver a prayer at the inaugural ceremony alongside other religious leaders, and not everybody's happy about it. Now, Paula White is a proponent of the prosperity gospel, which she denies. But the prosperity gospel says that faith is rewarded with material possessions and wealth. But the official term for what these people believe, the biblical term, is called heresy. Strong? Well, what is biblical heresy? The Apostle Paul ranks heresies with crimes and seditions in Galatians chapter 5. Paul's biblical writings are scripture, inspired of God. As such, they are infallible, inerrant, and authoritative. He says this stuff is heresy. The word also denotes divisions or schisms in the church, 1 Corinthians 11. In Titus 3.10, an heretical person is one who follows his own self-willed questions and who is to be avoided. Heresies thus came to signify self-chosen doctrines, those that did not emanate from God, 2 Peter chapter 2. The word heresy comes from a Greek word signifying, one, a choice, secondly, the opinion chosen, and thirdly, the sect holding the opinion. In the Acts of Apostles, chapter 5, chapter 15, chapter 24, the word denotes a sect without reference to its character. One conservative Christian, Eric Erickson, wrote, quote, Paula White, is a trinity-denying heretic. I don't know. She, he says she rejects the Council of Nicaea's creed that every Christian accepts. And to reject the orthodoxy of the Nicene Creed is to reject Christianity itself. Well, that settles it, right? No. Most Christians, pastors, so-called pastors, have no idea what the Nicene Creed is or why it exists. All right, you're a student, then turn to page 31 in my book called Frontal Assault. It's listed for you there. Nah, I don't put it, it takes up too much room to put it in there. But we talk about why it's there. It's an important document. It says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, was buried, and the third day he arose from the dead, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father, And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in the one holy Catholic, meaning universal. This is not a reference to the Roman Catholic Church. That didn't even exist when this came about and the apostolic church. 
I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. This is a creed that grew out of the Arian heresy, a heresy that said Jesus was not God, but he was simply the last soul on earth that had not yet fallen in Lucifer's rebellion. Now, the council agreed that Jesus was, is the very God, and man, a very man. Later, the creed would be expanded to include the deity of the Holy Spirit, which is, ex which is the expanded creed that I just read to you. It was a time before the Roman Catholic Church became imperial and all-consuming, a time when the basic doctrines were being settled and the deity of Christ was early on settled. I don't know if White denies the deity of Christ or not, but if she does, she's a heretic. But we know that she's charismatic, and we have seen her in company with those who preach the prosperity gospel. She's being accused also of being a prosperity preacher, and she denies it strongly. However, in 06, she kind of did say that's what she was. Posted on her official Paula White Ministries website, she says, Dear friend, I have a word for you that will impact your entire year and transform you in ways you could never imagine. God has given you the power to release the unlimited blessings of heaven in your life in 2006. Now, I want to show you a powerful principle of how God wants to position you for increase in 06. It is as simple as, quote, keeping the main thing, the main thing. And by that, I mean putting God first in every area of your life. Now, you've heard me say this before. She writes, you can plead promises all day long with no result when you violate principles. Friend, I don't want you to miss out on one of the most powerful principles to release God's power into your life, the principle of first fruits. You know where that came from? Think about it. Think about it. There was one guy in 1948, an itinerant, charismatic preacher in Oklahoma, who started preaching that. And as a result of that, his popularity grew and he became a Methodist, and he became respectable, and the next thing you know, he was on television, had his own TV show, built his own college, has his own whatever. His name is Oral Roberts. And the charismatic community will bow at this man's statue now because he's gone, but at his feet. He gave them this principle, this tool, and they have fleeced the flock <laughs> ever since she's ex she is pointing to it saying this is God's power into your life the principle of first fruits that's the prosperity gospel she goes on that's why January is the most important month of the year consecrated and holy by whom this month you should seek God for the rest of the year. And that's why this month, Randy, her husband, third husband, uh, and I bring a week's paycheck and say, God, we believe you for financial abundance. What we do with the first establishes the rest. God claims the first fruits of everything. And when you release your first fruit offering, it positions you for the harvest and releases God to do the blessing. When you sow the seed of your first fruits, you will reap God's power and favor in your life. Favor is another word for the word grace. Charismatics love the word favor. They're not too crazy about the word grace. But favor is one of the definitions of the word. But you can see where it expands the definition beyond the spiritual and into the practical. She goes on to say, you have the power to release his blessing today by dedicating your first fruits to him. How? Send it to me. No, she didn't say that. 
change the course of your entire year, perhaps your life today, and I look forward to hearing from you. That's code. That means send me your money. I look forward to hearing you. Listen to these people. They all say it. I look forward to hearing from you and the supernatural things God releases into your life through the principle of keeping first things first. That, my friends, is the prosperity gospel. But that's what she was. That's 06 or something. Maybe she's not that today. She did meet with the Donald in Trump Tower, where she has an apartment and where she has a condo. Can you imagine what it must cost to have an apartment and a condo in the Trump Tower in New York City? And what's a Texas preacher to have in that? Is it Texas or Florida? Why would anybody who doesn't have a church in New York live in New York? And why, for crying out loud, do you have to live in the swankiest place? Have you seen the place? Drive down Fifth Avenue gold. Well, it's not gold, but it gives you the illusion of gold everywhere. It must cost a fortune. Who's paying for that? I don't know any preachers that make that kind of money. Do you? She did meet with him. She met with him and two dozen other preachers. They laid hands on him and they prayed. And they prayed, even as we lay hands on him right now, let your hand be laid upon him. Let him have a greater encounter with you, a greater encounter with the Spirit of God. All the days of his life, let him live well, she prayed. I secure him. I secure his children. I secure his calling and his mantle. The man makes no claim of being a born-again Christian, a child of God. He makes a claim that he's a church member. The church where he's a member says he very rarely shows up there. Well, he moves around a lot. His mouth is not saved. His attitude is not saved. Does this all sound charismatic? Prosperity gospel type? But this is how they talk. They view themselves as modern-day biblical prophets with all the perks and proclivities, inclinations, and advantages of biblical prophets. They can pray God's power down, on, lay hands on people, and things happen. The Washington Examiner listed other objections from Christian leaders. Russell Moore, who's a Southern Baptist Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission guy, not my friend. Not a, I'm not a fan. He does some very strange things. But he got this one right. He says, Paula White is a charlatan. Recognized as a heretic by every Orthodox Christian of whatever tribe. <laughs> Paula Bolliard, who's a blogger and a supervising editor at something called PJ Media, writes, Paula White has a long history of bankruptcies, failed business ventures, unsuccessful marriages, which makes her the perfect choice to deliver a prayer on behalf of President-elect who has proudly proclaimed that he has never felt the need to ask forgiveness from God for anything. At one point, to, uh, according to the Tampa Tribune, Paula White's broadcast business, Paula White Ministries, was bringing in fifty to $80,000 a week. At one point, White lived in a $2.2 million water dollar motorfront Tampa Bay home. She owned several Mercedes, a condo at Trump Park Avenue, and a $3.5 million Trump Tower apartment. An IRS investigation in 04 that led, was led by Senator uh, Chuck Grassley, uh, event, and it was eventually dropped, had her in the net. None of these people fully responded to the government, and the thing didn't go anywhere, and it got dropped. One observer writes, White, who is now married to Jonathan Kane of rock band fame, Journey fame, uh, presides over glitzy and ostentatious services that are fueled by choreographed light shows, pulsating music, and dancers that lead up to the main event. 
the 50-year-old white usually clad in skin-tight dresses or pantsuits, sometimes thigh-high boots, prances around the stage to preach her gospel of health, wealth, and prosperity and offers to lay hands on those suffering with health problems and, of course, ask for donations from viewers at home. The church boasts a membership of 10,000, and one site puts her net worth at $5.2 million. Paula White is going to make their lives great again, and Trump is going to make America great again. But she's not a health, wealth, gospel preacher. The old-timers say, if it walks like a duck and it quacks. There is no doubt that Paula White is benefiting from the health and wealth gospel, even if she doesn't use the terminology. In her ministry, she has no biblical right to pastor any church. The Bible is quite clear. That belongs to to the male of the species. Well, you know, that was back then. Times have changed. We're talking biblical ecclesiology that is based, based on the infallible Word of God, the eternal, infallible Word of God. This is the heart of the doctrine we call bibliology. What is that book? on a collection of things that men wrote that's evolved over time? No. It is a collection of things men wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, and it has not changed over time. God has preserved it. They got stuff they've dug up 200 years before Christ. Did that in the 1940s uh, in, in the... Um, Israel. They've got a whole room with the scroll uh, uh, of the prophet Isaiah. And it is largely word for word what we have today. Books don't last that long. They change. They evolve. They live. You know. No. This is a different kind of book. And she is not biblically qualified to pastor a church, even if she were a man. She's divorced several times. The Bible forbids that. That Bible's not judging you if you've been divorced, but you're not going to be the pastor of a church. And there are very good reasons for that. Even if the Bible didn't say it, there'd be good reasons for that. The woman has no theological training. He said, you don't know. I listened to her talk. She has no idea what the Bible is about. She has no idea what theology is about. She's all over the map. She just, she's a marketer. She has no call to that ministry. She and her husband started that church. I know. People start churches all the time. But biblically, to start a church means that some other church has sent you, has vetted you, is holding you accountable. I was ordained by a church in, in New Jersey in 1974. That church to this day has the right to take that away from me. Colleges used to, I don't know if they still do, you get a degree. I know uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, you get a degree from there and you get yourself into heresy, they, they pull your degree. Don't go around telling people you have a degree from us anymore because you don't. It's called accountability. Ascending church. And does she really pastor a flock? Or is she just a performer with a bunch of people who show up? Do they have to join that church? Do they have to demonstrate faith in Christ, have a credible testimony of salvation in order to be a member of that church? Have they been baptized by immersion since they've been saved? These are all Bible ideas. And does she run the church? Or does the church hold her accountable, asking her to please come and minister to us within this frame? They go, any of these people doing this stuff. And what they're doing there is not biblical worship. You won't find any of that in the Bible anywhere. 
the the word worship is a term that the experts say probably is a a, a, a a derivative of the Greek word meaning to kiss, like a dog licking his master's hand, to fawn or, or, or crouch toward, that is literally or figuratively prostrate oneself in homage, do reverence, adore on your knees. She's prancing around like a circus act in a burlesque show. And they call it worship. You've heard me talk about this. You go to these churches and they, they, they drag out the band with the smoke and the, and the volume and the noise and they turn the lights down and, and the guy says, don't worry if you can't sing, we're going to be so loud you won't even hear yourself. And then they go off and ah, everybody goes nuts. Does that sound like worship? They call it that, but they've changed the definition. What they do is not honoring to God. They're honoring her or that church, or the entertainers, or themselves. And that's not just my opinion. <laughs> the Bible makes very clear statements as to what constitutes worship and what constitutes a Christian and what Christians are to do when they gather. What they receive there is basically obscene and probably not legal. I'm talking about the money. The church is not organized like a church. The accountability is not there. I doubt they have a constitution that regulates anything or anybody. She gets a huge amount of money. She's bought property in flagrant places at exorbitant cost. She travels in private jets. One would be hard-pressed to take a Bible and find what any of these people do or preach in that book. But it makes people feel good. Maybe make them feel better. People do testify being healed of sickness. To date, no objective evidence exists to support even one of those healings. And there have been investigations. They've been doing it for decades. And they're still waiting. They, the Charismatics, have evidence, but the world at large has had no luck in verifying even one. And if you can find one, please let me know. All they do is subjective and emotional. But she'll be there January 20th on that cold podium, and she'll be praying for the Donald. Which begs another question. What constitutes prayer? Prayer that God hears. We ain't even talking about whether he answers it. 